Hi there, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and welcome to this video on Introduction to Halo Alkanes. So in this video we're going to look at uh, nomenclature, in other words how we can name Halo Alkanes. We're going to look at uh, what we mean by a primary, secondary and tertiary Halo Alkane and how we can distinguish between uh, the three of them. We're also going to look at solubility of them, we're going to look at their boiling points, we're going to look at the bond enthalpy between the carbon and the halogen atom, and we're also going to look at bond polarity as well, and leading on to some reactions that will lead on to that as well. So, we're going to start with nomenclature. Now, nomenclature is naming organic molecules. So, if you're not too sure on how to do some bog standard uh, naming of organic molecules, I have done a video uh, that looks into that. So, we just click on the link below, and you can have a look at that if you would like a refresher. But I'm going to assume that you know how to... Uh, name a standard here. Uh, name a standard organic molecule. So we're going to start with obviously uh, the name halo alkane. Now, as the name suggests, we put the halogen before the alkane, as the as it suggests in there. So we've got an example here. You can see that we've got a bromine atom bonded to an ethane molecule. So in terms of nomenclature, we call that bromo ethane. Okay. Now, we don't need to put a number at the front of this, um, because the, even if the bromine appeared on this carbon, that would still be the first carbon. Um, so we just leave out the number, we put bromoethane. Can put the number in, but it's not required. Okay, we're going to look at a bit more of a complex one now. Now, in this one, we've got two halogens uh, that's uh, written into, the, uh, into a slightly longer hydrocarbon molecule. Now, the key rule here is that you've got to do it when you're, when you're naming the molecule, you've got to do it in alphabetical order, not numerical. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find our longest chain, which is obviously just three carbons. We're then going to num uh, number the chain as well. Now, I can number it in two ways. I need to start from one here and do one, two, three, but that would leave me with an iodine on the second carbon and chlorine on the third, or I can number it back to front. So I could do it one, two, three, uh, and that would mean a, a the uh, chlorine is on the first carbon and the iodine is on the second carbon. Now, the second way, the one that I've just mentioned, uh, is the way that actually should go because uh, according to IUPAC rules, we should have the lowest numbering system possible. So I'm going to write our numbers on there just to make it a bit clearer. So we've got one, two, three. Okay, so in terms of the uh, uh, naming of this molecule, we start with the uh, lowest alphabet, lowest uh, letter in the alphabet first between chlorine and iodine. C becomes four I, so we name the chloro one first. So what we do is we write one dash chloro because uh, it's on the first carbon. We put the dash in between the one and the chloro bit. That's really important. Uh, and then we've got two iodo because that's the iodine one. Uh, and then three carbons means it's propane. So we're going to put propane on there. Now, all of this would be in one word, but I've obviously ran out of space, so I've decided to write it underneath instead. Um, and this is really important, especially if we have chlorine and iodine. Let's say if we swap them two over, um, it would actually be uh, two chloro, one iodopropane. So it's not numerical order, it has to be alphabetical always. C comes before I. Okay, so we're just going to have a look at the and what we mean by primary, secondary, and tertiary. So we can see here we've got some uh, three different halo alkanes. The first one is primary because we've got a halogen here that's bonded to a carbon, which is only bonded to one other carbon. These two are hydrogens. So I've represented uh, the carbon as R because this could be a long carbon chain. It might just be might might not be just one carbon. So that's why I put R1 on there. So that just represents a carbon chain. Secondary, halogen is bonded to a carbon, which is bonded to two other carbons. So that's the secondary one. And tertiary is the halogen is bonded to a carbon, which is bonded to three other carbons that's surrounding it there. And that's how you name, uh, that's how you identify it as a primary, secondary, or tertiary. Now, some examples want you to know how to distinguish between this. So you need to check your uh, syllabus to make sure this is relevant for you. And what you can do is you can add to all three of these, you can add water uh, to these molecules, uh, and what will happen is the haloalkane will react to form an alcohol, uh, and it will also form a halide ion as well, which is X minus. So effectively, the bonds broken apart, broken apart. And uh, what we can do at the same time is, if we add silver nitrate to this, uh, it will actually react with the halide ion that's floating around in the solution. 
Now, uh, it will form a precipitate of the silver halide ion. So, for example, if this was a bromine, then you would see a cream precipitate of silver bromide that's floating around. But the order of it is really important. And the tertiary molecule will form the precipitate first. And this suggests that the tertiary is more reactive than the um, secondary. Uh, and this is more reactive than the primary. And this one will precipitate out. Well, it might not even precipitate at all. It depends on uh, the temperature conditions of this. And you need to warm them up a little bit. But the key thing that you need to know is that this one reacts first, followed by secondary, followed by tertiary. The reasons why you don't need to know it at all. Okay, so if we just come on to solubility, some physical properties now. So um, solubility is obviously the ability for the molecule to dissolve. And if it's going to dissolve in um, uh, water, it has to form hydrogen bonds. Now, unfortunately, haloalkanes don't have hydrogen bonds. The strongest intermolecular force in a haloalkane is a dipole-dipole, and it also has van der Waals forces as well. So these things are actually not very soluble in water. They're pretty insoluble. Um, but the advantage is they'll actually mix with hydrocarbons, which are non-polar, so like oils and grease. And that makes them really good as dry cleaning fluids. So we use haloalkanes in a dry cleaning situation when we don't have any water. We're just spraying it with chemicals, and that can help bring out uh, greases and oils uh, from um, uh, from items of clothing. So that makes them really good for that use. Okay, boiling point. So as we go down the group, so for example, if we have uh, this group here, so if we have a, um, a haloethane molecule, so if we start with a fluoride molecule and then we go down, the next halogen down will be chlorine, then bromine, then iodine, then acetine. So as we go down the group, um, group seven, the atom or the halogen gets a lot bigger. Now, because this atom is bigger, it means we have more electrons. And because we have more electrons, that means we have greater van der Waals forces as we go down the group. So because we have greater van der Waals forces, it means we need more energy to overcome these forces. Uh, and that increases the boiling point. So the size of the halogen plays a big role in the uh, boiling point of the molecule. Okay, so what I want, then want to do is just come on to um, bond polarity first, and then I'll come on to bond entropy. So these halogens actually have a polar parts to their molecule, and we can represent that by doing a delta positive and a delta negative symbol. And you see here, I've got a C and I've got an X, so this is the hero alkane. X will represent the halogen. Okay, so what we have is the X is actually electronegative. And that means um, it will pull electrons towards itself in this covalent bond. Uh, and because it will do that, it's effectively got a little uh, polarity on it, a little charge. Uh, because it's pulling electrons towards itself, it takes a delta negative charge. Uh, and the carbon is effectively losing some of its electrons towards the uh, halogen. It's still in a bond with the halogen, but it doesn't have the electrons uh, on its side. So it forms a delta positive charge. Now, obviously, as we go further up group seven, uh, the uh, element becomes more electronegative. So something like fluorine is the most electronegative element. Uh, and that means that the um, groups like this, which we call a nucleophile, these are nucleus loving uh, groups, will actually uh, be able to attack the delta positive carbon, which is this here, because they, are, they have a lone pair of electrons and this will go in and attack this delta positive carbon. Um, now, the more polar that bond is, the more likely your nucleophile is going to attack it. Um, and there are reactions, and we've got some examples here. So ammonia could be a nucleophile because it has a lone pair of electrons. Uh, cyanide could be a nucleophile, and so could OH minus. But the crucial thing is they don't have to have a negative charge. But they do have to have a lone pair of electrons. They donate to the uh, carbon and hence kick off the halogen. Now, you might expect that actually the more polar this bond is, then the faster the rate of reaction or the, the more likely the reaction is going to happen. Uh, and that's actually not the case. Uh, we do have another aspect which actually overrides the uh, bond polarity aspect of it. We call this bond enthalpy. Now, this is the amount of energy required to break the bond between the carbon and the halogen bond. So actually, as we go down the group, the bond enthalpy becomes a lot weaker. Um, so, and it's explained by the size of the halogen atom. You can see here, we've got a CF uh, bond here. Now, fluorine's a really small atom, 
Uh, and what that means is the, um, the attractive forces between the bonding pair that's being shared and the nucleus of the fluorine atom uh, is actually quite strong. And that's because the atom is really small and there isn't much shielding between the outer electrons that are being shared and the nucleus. But if we go onto the other side, say for example bromine, which is a much bigger atom, um, the lone pair of electrons, that's, uh, sorry, the uh, shared pair of electrons that's being shared in the bond is now not feeling the uh, nuclear attraction as much because the atom is so much bigger uh, and the, um, uh, the shielding effect is much greater. In other words, there's more electrons between the nucleus and the outer electrons. So what this means is it means that the bond entropy is actually weaker because that attractive force isn't as strong. So as we go down the group, uh, group seven, um, the bond entropy becomes a lot weaker. And that means uh, that not as much energy is required to break that bond. So that means that groups like iodide uh, haloalkanes are actually more reactive than uh, fluoride uh, haloalkanes. Uh, and that's really, really important because actually that proves to us that bond enthalpy has far more of an effect on how reactive a haloalkane is than bond polarity. And that's a really, really important point to remember. You can't get the two mixed up. It is really easy to say that the more, uh, um, uh, the, more the halogen can pull electrons towards itself, so the more electronegative the halogen is, the more reactive the, halo, the haloalkane will be. That's not the case. It's to do with bond entropy. But um, that's it. Hope that helps. Bye.